Here's a chart from a magazine article in 1978 uh, in Scientific American. The whole issue that month was devoted to evolution. And in the chapter on mammal evolution, we had this chart. Uh, it shows the different kinds of mammals there at the top. Kangaroo and anteater and rabbit and squirrel and gorilla and uh, whales and tigers and camels and horses, etc. The blue bars coming down are showing us how deep down in the fossil record those creatures appear. And then you'll notice that there are some blue dotted lines that connect these some of these blue bars to creatures that they don't know what look like, some creatures that they have an idea, and then they're all, cre all connected to a common ancestor, which they don't have a name for or a picture of. <laughs> now, the question is, does the fossil record support the dotted blue lines? And I call as my expert witness on this question, Dr. Stephen J. Gould. Until his death in 2002, he was probably America's most famous evolutionist. He was an atheist Jew. And he hated creationists, but he was one of the most honest evolutionists. He was a professor of geology and paleontology at Harvard. And he said this about the fossil record. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. I want you to notice two things in that statement. First of all, he tells us that we only have data at the tips and the nodes of the branches. We don't have fossil evidence, he says, for the branches themselves. And then he says, this fact is the trade secret of paleontology. In other words, either all the paleontologists know this and have kept it a secret from the rest of us in society, or only the elite paleontologists like Stephen Gould, who have access to the huge museums, know this, and the low-level junior college paleontologists don't know this. But it's a trade secret, and he says the, the transitional forms are extremely rare. That is, if evolution is true, you ought to be able to find fossils of 90% uh, reptile, 10% bird. 80% reptile, 20% bird. 70% reptile, 30% bird. 50% reptile, 50% bird, and so on. But he says this is extremely rare. In fact, the evolutionists can only point to a handful of very controversial fossils. So let's draw that diagram from Scientific American the way Stephen Gould says the evidence really is. You'll notice that I erased all the dotted blue lines. That's because Dr. Gould said we don't really have fossil evidence for those dotted blue lines. And then I did one other thing. I changed the bottom ends of those blue bars. I took away the little bend. Why? Because the blue bars don't exist in the fossil record. They only exist on this page of the magazine. It's the fossil creatures that are in the rock record. And as far as they go down, when they find a kangaroo, it looks like a kangaroo. It doesn't look like a part kangaroo. As far as they go down, they see a camel. It's a camel, not a part camel. Now, that to me does not look like the evolution tree of life. It looks a lot like the creation forest of life. And Gould goes on in the article that I quoted to say that the two characteristics of the fossil record are abrupt appearance and stasis. That is, that the first time we see a creature appearing in the lowest rock formation that we find it, it appears fully formed, fully functional, fully recognizable. It just abruptly appears. And then as we come up through the rock records, as long as we see that creature, it basically stays the same. Oh, a little bit of variety, but it's basically the same creature. Now, I mentioned that the evolutionists do have some fossil evidence uh, that they put forth for evolution. It's rare, but uh, here's one of the evidences. Phil Gingrich, writing in the Journal for Geological Education, a journal for science teachers, he had this picture of this creature that looked like a transitional form between a land animal and a whale. Uh, evolutionists believe that la whales evolved from land animals. And you can see that it is on its way to becoming a whale. Its rear end is definitely moving in that direction. It's already on a fish diet. The front legs are still land animal, though. What was the fossil evidence for Phil Gingrich uh, to have his artist draw this? Well, he tells us it was the head. 
No, it was not the head. It was just the stippled parts of the skull. He had no fossil evidence at this time below the neck. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it difficult to see how you can take that piece of bone and that piece of bone and then tell me what the front legs looked like and what the rear end looked like. But Phil Gingrich said about this creature, which he called Pachycetus, which means whale from Pakistan, which is where the fossil was found. In time and in its morphology, Pachycetus is perfectly intermediate, a missing link between earlier land mammals and later full-fledged whales. Well, now that article was written in 1994, but they found some more fossils after 1994. And... Uh, in a technical article in the British journal Nature, which is the world's leading English language technical science journal, uh, there was an article in 2001 about Pachycetus and all the fossil evidence they had found since 1994. And uh, this was the evidence. Looks a lot like a whale to me, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, by our study of anatomy, the scientists can guess pretty well what this creature looked like when it was alive. And they said these were terrestrial mammals, that is land-based mammals, no more amphibious than a tapir, kind of like a pig. I don't know if you've been down to the ocean side recently, but uh, I haven't seen any pigs swimming in the ocean recently. So this is a case of misinterpreted fossil evidence, jumping to conclusions on the basis of very skimpy evidence. And the evolutionists in the last hundred years have done this over and over again. The pieces of evidence for horse evolution and whale evolution. And I was developing this talk at that time and I thought, well, this ought to be interesting. I think I'll see what they have to say about whale evolution. So I clicked on the icon and came to this page. And uh, it had a picture on the uh, left of this creature with its nostril near the tip of its nose, Pachycetus, dated 50 million years ago. And then this creature over here, beluga whale, with the nostrils up here at the top of the skull. Well, obviously, if that Pachycetus evolved into a whale, then you've got to move that, that uh, hole for the nose. But listen, there's more to making a sea creature out of a land animal than just moving the hole. Uh, I'll give you a simple scientific experiment. You can go home tonight, put clay up your nostrils here, and then get your electric drill and put two holes up there. <laughs> See if you breathe just as well. No, no, don't, don't do that. I don't want any lawsuits. So it's not just a matter of moving the holes. But then it says transitional form. So I clicked on that icon and up popped this picture. And lo and behold, the nostrils are in the middle of the skull and the skull is dated at 25 million years. I mean, that's perfect. That is a transitional form. You creationists, what more do you want? This is a proof of evolution. Well, I said, okay, I know what Pachycetus is. But uh, beluga whales, I'm not an expert on whales, so I had to go on the web and hunt around a little bit. Uh, that's what a beluga whale looks like. But now, I do see this. I wonder what that is. Uh, they didn't have any information right there at that place on the uh, Berkeley website, so I hunted around a little bit, found out that Ithiocetus was called somewhere else on the, web, on the Berkeley website and also on another website about whales, that it was the earliest baleen whale. Well, what's a baleen whale? Well, I got a picture of a baleen whale. Now, a baleen whale does not have teeth. They have baleen. It's a, a sieve system. They open their mouth, take in a big gulp of water and all kinds of uh, food, and then they let the water run out through the, the sieve and keep the food in their mouth. That's a completely different system from this Ithiocetus. But there's another thing about baleen whales. They are anywhere from 2 to 40 times bigger than a beluga whale. This is not a transitional form between that and that. <laughs> this is a 100% fully operational whale like that one is, and this is not suited for living in the water. Now, I can only come to one of two conclusions. Either the University of California Berkeley scientists who put this website together are grossly ignorant about Pachycetus, beluga whales, and baleen whales, or... They are deliberately deceiving the public. And I find it hard to believe that they could be that ignorant. I think this is a classic case of deception, of deliberately deceiving the public. The, the vast majority of people who will visit that website will never do the exploration that I did to check 
what was going on. 